Welcome to the Cloudonaut podcast. My name is Andreas, and today I'm joined by a special guest, Stephen Kansley. We are on a mission to explore Amazon Web Services, so listen to this podcast to deepen your AWS knowledge, stay up to date, and be inspired. This is episode number 44, and we are recording this at February the 10th in 2022. This podcast in particular, and Cloud on Out in general, is only possible through donations from our supporters. Therefore, I want to thank Alan Leach, Alex Debris, Jeff Finlay, Jay Hordley, Ken Snyder, Torsten Höger, Todd Valentine, Sam Onaga, and all anonymous supporters for making Cloud on Out possible. Please become a supporter of our work too. You will find all the details at cloudonout.io, support us, as well as in the show notes. So, Stephen, back to you. Um, would you start by introducing yourself a little bit, please? Yes, thank you, Andreas. Uh, so, I spent years leading migrations to AWS, like many other consultants. And the hardest part was always IAM. Nobody knew how to do it, and it was always taking a ton of time and energy. So, now I'm tackling that problem and making AWS IAM usable for cloud teams at K9 Security. I also wrote a book to help you, Effective IAM for AWS. Perfect. Thank you very much for introducing yourself. So all that will be in the show notes. So the links to the book, um, to, to the company, to the solution you're providing. Uh, so go, go there and check that out. So you already mentioned it. Um, today we want to talk about IAM. So this is all about authentication, authorization for AWS services. And um, I would say, let's get started uh, right away. So maybe to share, so we have something in common. We both have been consultants for um, migra mig migrating workloads to AWS. And as you said, IAM is actually <laughs> a crucial service because it, it manages, um, or it's, it's responsible for um, the security in the cloud or of at least a very large aspect of it. So the first thing is, um, what do you think is, um, what is the hardest part about AWS IAM? So what is so difficult about it? <laughs> yeah, so I think, I think that's a really important question. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, implementing lease privilege and, uh, or, you know, granting lease permissions. And I think that is a, a good goal. But I think it's a very difficult task for people to actually do. There's thousands of API actions, uh, and like you really sometimes have to dig into the docs um, to understand what's necessary. Uh, and so what I see teams doing a lot is they they start off down that path, and they're like, you know, I want to grant lease privilege, and then two, three, four days goes by, and they start putting wild cards into, you know, at least the API actions, um, or they, or they just, you know, copy something from a AWS launch blog post. Uh, what, what are what do you see? Yes, definitely. So, so that's what I observe as well. So typically it is, so when it doesn't matter if you build a greenfield project or if you're doing a migration, you're always focused on shipping the thing, right? So it's all about getting the infrastructure up and running, getting the application up and running, and making sure that it um, yeah that it works, or that it scales, um, and then security and in, in particularly I am I am and policies and roles and all that is something that is typically postponed until the end of a project. <laughs> and the the problem is um, as it is. You really need to know about the details to get it right, to implement these privileges. And so it's a lot of work. You need a lot of understanding to get it right as well. So I think that is um, really, really a challenge here. Yeah. So when I was, when I was studying, I am from a usability perspective. Uh, I, so I love Don Norman's books. Um, you know, he's the author of things like the design of everyday things. And he has this model where you need to like understand like how to configure the thing. And you need to be able to understand like how the system is actually configured. 
And so there's like a lot of steps in there. Uh, and especially with IAM, it can be difficult to know what to do, like how to do it. Um, and then it's can be difficult to know what you actually did, like what the effects were, especially as it pertains to all the other policies and entities in an account. So if you have a, a single workload in an account, like it's relatively easy to implement least privilege because you can get away with just allowing a few things. But if you're in an account with other applications, you are susceptible to any other uh, I am user or role with a managed policy on it that allows access to like all the resources, you know, so like the AWS S3 uh, full access policy is a good example. Like it allows all actions for S3 to all buckets. So if you have two applications that both have a bucket, well now, you know, if one of those principles has that policy, it can access both buckets account as an isolation boundary itself so that the I am policies and rules and everything doesn't don't get too tricky don't get too complicated I think that's um, helping um, yes yeah, so, to get it so right. I fully agree with that uh, and I am a, f a firm believer that because I am as a global service in, in that uh, the configurations of IAM apply to every region in the AWS account. So you can't just, you know, separate workloads by say region, which wouldn't make sense from a performance perspective in most cases. But um, you, you can't say like, well, US East one is going to be prod and US West two is going to be dev. And, and, you know, those, those environments often need very different privileges. Like people need to be able to create and destroy things like databases and dev on a regular basis. And you never want to do that in prod without like serious thought, um, if at all. And so it becomes difficult to mix workloads, especially at different stages of the delivery cycle in a single account. And so I never recommend putting dev and prod in the same account, um, at least certainly in my, well, I, I never recommend that. Um, and I think it's, you know, and people talk about using things like, uh, ABAC attribute based access control to solve this problem. But I feel like it's just too much complexity. Um, it, it, uh, because now you've, uh, moved the challenge into controlling access to tags, which are really like a, you know, mostly a data. Uh, plain kind of concern. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that resource boundaries and putting access controls directly on an S3 bucket on an KMS key is a much more effective way to guard against unwanted access to data within an account. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. I agree on those. Um, I am policies based on tags as well, because actually whenever I try to implement something like that, uh, I came to the edges where you're no longer able to configure an IAM policy in a way that you can restrict things on text because it's not fully supported for all the resources and all the actions. So I think you, you can do maybe 80%, but then you have 20% <laughs> left, but which is, I don't know, unacceptable from my point of view of in many times. Um, but also, um, I think one thing that I want to share. So I, I often do. Um, a security review of an AWS account. So I come into a project most, mostly at the end of a migration or a greenfield project before it goes live. And I do a review of their AWS account and I focus mostly on the uh, IAM part of uh, the, the security. And um, just maybe to, to give some, some examples. So what can go wrong when you don't got, get least privilege uh, right? Uh, I can share some of my uh, experience that I have. So I had uh, reviewed an AWS account where, for example, the web server instances, so the EC2 instances running the web application that they developed themselves, those instances had, for example, full access to RDS. So that means um, when the application or the instance gets compromised, it has full access to RDS, which means you can delete all the databases and all the backups uh, in the account. So, so just to give you an example on um, it's it's really important to get those things right. Or another example was, and um, this was a 
customer uh, using um, managed AWS policies. And they had attached a very popular, actually, IAM policy to all their instances, which granted full read access to all the buckets in the account, which meant um, that even sensitive data in some of those buckets was now ac accessible, um, at least in theory, from all those instances. So I think maybe that those are two examples. Maybe you have some more um, that it's really important to get those least privileges right with IAM. Yeah, so, so to build on your your read-only, uh, access read-only permissions, a lot of third-party monitoring tools, especially uh, e even those in the security space that are auditing accounts, will often uh, use or, or request that you use the read-only policy, which gives them full access to data in your account. Uh, and I always counsel clients, that's a, that's a really bad idea. Um, because now they they have full access to read your DynamoDB tables, your S3 buckets, decrypt KMS, you know, data encrypted with KMS, at least by default. So you can always protect those data sources with a KMS key, um, with a resource policy that does grant least privilege. And the way you do that is like, okay, yeah, you, you want to grant the allows for the things that are authorized to access that thing, that resource. But then you also need to deny access to everyone else. And so that's the key, uh, one, one of the key things that I like to share with people. Um, and I go through that in the book. There's like full examples. You know, we're not going to, I don't want to talk through the policy uh, in detail here. It's like 200 lines as, <laughs> as I am policies often are. Um, but it can be it can be quite tricky to prevent unwanted access because AWS, you know, they they want their customers to succeed and get that workload running. And so much of the guidance and material is around like granting the right allows or granting some set of allows to get you to success, to get the application working. Um and there's there's often not nearly as much clear guidance on how to prevent unwanted access, especially in a scalable way. Um, like, you know, to, to, to create that deny everyone else statement. So, you know, you, you often need to do like some fancy work with conditions and like, uh, likes, you know, matching, matching I am principles with likes or, um, in, in your deny. So, you know, check it, you know, you can check out resources for that. Um, but it, you know, I want one of the things I want to share with with your listeners is that like granting least privilege is hard. Like it's 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 often you know thrown out there like oh you should go implement least privilege like and it's like a throwaway comment like this is easy, but it's not. You want to you need to design uh, like a couple of strategies for doing this and then stick with those. Because to actually implement least privilege takes a, a lot of time and energy. And so you want to probably encapsulate that in some sort of reusable component or building block that you can use over and over again. Because you can't take two or three weeks to re-engineer this every every time you deploy an application. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. So so having templates, components, or, or maybe even something that you can copy and paste <laughs> yeah. uh, helps a lot. Um, to get um, up and running without um, going into just allowing everything <laughs> so that it works. Yeah. yeah, that's really helpful. And I think that that helps um, AWS customers to succeed. So um, I want to want to talk about one other thing that I observe. So I think when, when you get started with AWS, so when people or organizations get started with AWS, um, they start with learning about the services, typically they use the management console to, to spin up the infrastructure. And I think to one thing why it is so hard to understand IAM is it's basically um, operating on API level. So you basically need an understanding of the underlying AWS APIs of the different services um, to really understand what is going on. And I think that is my advice. So if you really want to master IAM, I think you should always also take a look at the API documentations of the services that you're using to understand the different actions, what they are doing. Um, so I think this is, 
giving you a feeling for what could go wrong here when I just allow all EC2 actions, for example. Because if you have an idea of what is behind this API, um, it helps you to, to get a mental model of the whole thing and to um, write IAM policies uh, later. Yeah, so I think, I think especially in terms of mastering IAM, um, you, you have to understand the individual API actions of services or permissions. Um, uh, the, the things we put into the API actions block are uh, often actually permissions. Um, but in terms of scaling that activity, if, you, if we think about what it takes to deliver applications quickly, uh, I'm, a, I'm definitely a proponent of simplifying the IAM actions into uh, groupings for, for a service um, such that non-experts can understand like, yes, I want to grant the ability to read data um, or administer the resource or delete data like um, and enable the broad team to be able to interact and de and declare their intent at that level instead of always having to understand the underlying API actions. Um, now for experts like you do, and someone has to perform those classifications, but if we wanna like scale security, I think uh, it's important to simplify I am um, so that going back to Norman's model, people can quickly understand how to use this thing and then to use it safely and correctly. Um, and, and yeah, you, you, in some sense, uh, you, you lose a bit of what it means to be least privileged, but I think it's an, an important question. Do we care about granting? Is it, is it really an issue? if we grant both S3 get object and guess S3 get object version, when we say, yeah, you can have read data capability versus only the S3 uh, get object that they might need. Because really what we're trying to prevent is granting S3 delete object or, you know, uh, put object when they don't need it. I, in my view, what do you, what do you think Andres? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I like that idea. Um, I think there's really, um, it depends on um, what you're trying to achieve. And also I think it depends a little bit on how deep you are into uh, the technical details here. So, so I totally agree that it makes sense to, to use um, predefined components, predefined policies that you use for granting read access to a specific resource or um, uh, management access maybe to a service. I think that's, that's totally fine. I think um for me um the it is i think it is probably the 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 aws managed policies for me are um not too helpful in that regard because they never uh, grant you the possibility to specific a specific or to restrict the access to specific resources so but i like the idea of having your own components that you can reuse that are a little bit more fine granular that you can reuse for specific use case that come up um, quite often. So maybe let's do some examples. So many applications running on EC2 Lambda or containers need access to S3, for example. So it, it, could, it would be a very good approach to have an S3 access component um, for read and write access to specific uh, buckets, for example. Mm -hmm. That's what I would, uh, where I totally agree with you. I also agree that it's not important to go into the action level in, in every case. Um, on the other side, I think in, in some, in some scenarios, it is maybe, um, also possible to do so. I think it depends a little bit on how, um, how much control and how much knowledge you have, um, uh, of AWS and also about, the, the applications and uh, maybe also the humans that need to interact um, with AWS. One step back, so I think also when you do infrastructure as code, and I think that is also uh, a popular thing nowadays is to have infrastructure as code components that you can reuse. So we have some for CloudFormation, there's Terraform modules, there's the CDK that is built on, on top of that idea. So I think when you have such infrastructure as code components, it makes a lot of sense to build in 
the iron policies that are needed for that as well, so that you do not have to uh, reinvent the wheel each time you're creating, I don't know, a, a basic container a web application or something like that. So that it includes that already. That makes a lot of sense as well, I would say. Yeah, yeah. And and that's precisely what we've done at K9 with, we have Terraform and CDK modules to generate least privilege S3 and, and KMS uh, key policies. And I having having spent weeks literal weeks developing these things, um, I, I highly recommend packaging them into something that you can reuse, uh, whether it's an infrastructure as code component or like a simple template generator uh, or, you know, a generator that generates the policy um, because you, we get the value from reusing the solution, <laughs> right? Not from writing the solution. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of, figure out where you want to control access within within your reference architectures and find little components that satisfy the building blocks that you need. Okay, so you're going to use S3, you're going to use KMS. Like I love KMS because so many people have encryption at rest requirements. And we have to remember that the the point of encryption is actually to control access. So we have this, these beautiful key policies that we can, we can put on our encryption keys that literally control access and, and give you a, a, a single place to like look at who has access to data. Um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of, of KMS key policy. Um, but even, even key policy has nuance. Um, it's, it's like the only KMS keys are the only resource with a policy that does not allow the root user access by default. Like there's <laughs> like, there's a little nuance and gotcha. Like, you know, it's in the docs. Um, it's, it's not uh, exactly clearly written in my, in my view, but, um, and certainly not there in blinking lights. Like here's a big exception <laughs> to the rest of IAM. But, you know, like once you have that solution, you can, you can create resource boundaries with, with encryption and like, they can span an entire application or a department um, and really, you know, lock down and prevent access from unwanted um, principles. Because as you said, AWS managed policies cannot restrict who they grant access to by resource or by principle because they're for everyone. So you, you always have to like, uh, you know, you can take some of the ideas from those policies and then um, uh, iterate on them. But you know the once there's wild cards running around, like you have to understand, you're granting um, wide access to resources or principles or or whatever. Maybe to to get a little bit more practical here. Um, so I I collected a few examples um, where I regularly need to write IAM policies for. So when doing um, lift and shift migrations, uh, or when, for example. Um, creating an infrastructure or getting basically an open source application up and running on AWS. So you have that third party application that might interact with AWS. So most often it's S3 access or a DynamoDB table or something like that. So um, in this example where you have a, a, an application that you do not own yourself, no one in your organization knows a lot about it. Um, of course, the source code is open source, but you probably don't understand much of it because you have never touched it before. So the question for me is, um, do you have any um, approaches to get an IAM policy written for such a third party application that needs access to some AWS services? Sure. Well, first thing I would be trying to consult the docs and see what they recommend as a policy. Um, and then if it's, if it's fairly narrow, I might just start with that. Um, but if, but if they want like read only access, then I actually, um, do one of two things. I, I may start looking for something else. Um, or I may just like start looking through the code to see what they have. Um, there's, there's also some, some newer, uh, technology available to, um, kind of investigate what it actually uses quickly. Like you can run the application, um, and, and 
you do things like look at cloud trail to see what's there. Uh, that's a classic one, although you're going to miss data events like S3 get object or put object or SQS messages. Um, um, and uh, do, do you have any other ideas that you want to share here? So yeah, one thing that, that came to my mind here is, so Michael has written a blog post about that and there is uh, something called client-side monitoring for the AWS CD, SDK and CLI, which means you can, when the, uh, so given the fact that the application, the open source, for example, a third-party application uses the SDKs, which is probably uh, correct, then you can enable that and it basically locks all the API calls um, locally. So you can uh, grab that and uh, use that to analyze the concrete API calls that the application is doing, and then use that as a foundation for um, building your IAM policy. So that, that might be an issue, or that might be a possibility to get an IAM policy written. Um, oftentimes, I think, as you said, documentation or going through the source code is probably um, a little bit uh, simpler, but in, in cases where you really don't know <laughs> what the application is doing or it's failing. So I, had it, I had that experience that a specific feature was just not working and I, I didn't know why I didn't couldn't couldn't get my head around it and then I looked at this client side monitoring logs from the SDK and I've, I've actually found the issue by doing so um, so sometimes this is better than trial and error <laughs> so very just sit there and and try to <laughs> um, get your uh, policy in the in the right way so yeah it's it's still a lot of work to do um, and I made the observation that um, many projects have some documentation, but they have an IAM policy that I don't want to <laughs> attach to an application like that in my account. So it's often, unfortunately, needed to to get more specific there. Um, so right, uh, right. I think the client side monitoring approach is pretty neat, and so I tried uh, doing this the other day. I was trying to figure out if I could scale it. Um, I was working with someone to deploy uh, I am live to a Fargate container and make it available on the network and then capture those logs uh, in S3. Um, and so that from a development experience or like in CI CD, you could run, like you could, you could initially grant, um, a wide open or a wider policy and then see what it actually uses um, in practice, like in a test environment and capture, uh, try to create a, like a least privilege um, policy that way. Um, of course, there's also the I am access analyzer policy generator service now. Um, so, you know, AWS is making some progress uh, there, um, but Still, you know the the feedback loop. I I, I like the idea uh, of the of the client side monitoring feedback loop um, because it it should be pretty quick. So when the application is developed in house, I think it's it's a little bit easier because you can um, have having more deeper access to the code, or also have someone you can pro hopefully ask about the code <laughs> that can guide you in in the right directions to find those information in the code. So I think that is um, a simpler task to do. And I want to, so that's an, a question for you. So how do you m write IAM policies for people, groups of people? So let's say a, a group of developers that need access to an AWS account. So how do you um, define IAM policies in that scenario? So do you have any approach that you can share? So, you know, it usually would start with, like trying to connect with the actual developers is so it not their managers? Um, mm. <laughs> uh, but like, and then like pair with them. And, and I think this is an approach where if you have DevOps or cloud engineers, like working on this with embedded in the development team of a new application, um, that, you know, it's, it's easy enough to pair and you can listen in on and stand up and say like, you can listen for like, oh, we're adding some new thing to talk to SQS or whatever. Like, okay, great. Like, we're going to need to update the IAM policy. Um, but, 
you know, a lot of there, there's two models. There's the let's let's build a, a policy up from the ground up, or let's give it a lot of privileges and look at CloudTrail, look, use client side monitoring or something else to figure out what it actually used. Um, so in in practice, I've seen the latter model where you you have more. Uh, you give the application more privileges and see what it actually uses and then narrow it um, at, at some point. And the trick is you have to be disciplined about coming to that some point and actually narrowing it down so you don't have the app running as some sort of administrator. <laughs> yeah. And I think when, when it comes to granting groups of people access to an AWS account, I think is always um, the balance between um, granting them um, very wide access, which allows them to get their work done quickly, basically, or to narrow it down in a very strict way, which might be a little bit more secure in some way, but it also slows down the progress a lot. So I've seen many organizations that had um, a lot of concerns about using all the services that are available or using some parts of the services and they really restricted access to the developers, the engineers very strictly, which ended, which, which resulted in they couldn't really get their work done. They had to ask for someone to extend their iron policy and stuff like that. And it took days uh, for that to, to get done. So I think when it comes to, um, yeah, defining IAM policies for, for people that need to work in an AWS account. This is really a challenge. And I think, again, the advice from the beginning of our discussion helps here to have AWS accounts to isolate workloads, because that's often, um, um, yeah, what helps to also get those access for, for people, right? So I think I missed something on your last question, which was, was specifically about people and that I'm a big believer in modeling the job functions uh, that exist in your organization and that uh, you, you're, so you're going to have application engineers, uh, database administrators, security roles, etc. And each of those should get a role in an AWS account. And the key is that you know, you're going to go ahead and, and grant them certain permissions for each of those roles. Uh, and the key is, is that in a large organization, you should use AWS accounts to separate people by their natural departments and business units so that the cloud and platform people in, you know, the e-commerce group, uh, you know, they have separate, you know, they get a role in their AWS accounts and they're separate from the cloud and platform people in the data warehouse group. And that way, you know, we've, we've aligned within the organizational management boundaries. And so, you know, they're, they're, those cloud people are not able to like delete their respective or sorry, the, the other team's stuff. Um, but, but yeah, I don't think it's a good idea to restrict people so much, um, in their abilities, especially in dev. Um, you have to be careful about doing that. I, like, I, I think it is important to use things like service control policies to, to enforce organization wide or department wide, um, architecture practices. Like we're going to use Dynamo, you know, you, where you allow Dynamo DB, but not simple DB, let's say, uh, uh, and like, okay, these are, these are data services that we're going to use, or we're going to enforce that you only use PCI compliant services and stuff like that, or certain regions. And then like, you know, give people fairly um, broad access, you know, maybe you prevent database deletion or something like that, but um, at least in dev and then, and then restrict it, get more restrictive as you go to production, those same roles, exist, but they have different permissions depending on the stage in the software delivery lifecycle. The SCPs are, are really important to to really get the basic account set up or the basic um, yeah which services do we want to use for example right 
Uh, and I think you do again. You should. They shouldn't be too complex. <laughs> they should be really easy, very straightforward, so that it's easy to understand in the organization um, which services are restricted by our SCP and something like that. Because I've th seen very complex SCP policies, and um, it was then very hard to debug <laughs> the problems because you had no idea what uh, what was going on um, behind that. So I think that's that's important. Um, the other thing I want to maybe I share some, some experience I, ha I have observed with an uh, organization that migrated um, workloads to AWS. So um, they used an AWS account per team. So each team got it, its own AWS account and they migrated their workloads um, to this account. So one by <laughs> one by one. Um, and at the end, they had, I don't know, let's say 10 different workloads running in, in one AWS account. But it was fine. This was their account. They were responsible for all the workloads in their account. So it was not too hard to get IAM policies right. But then management decided we will shift some workloads to another team. <laughs> and now the trouble started because now you had to use IAM policies to isolate the different workloads from each other so that the engineers of the one team could not interf interfere with the resources uh, of the workloads from the other team. And then it got really tricky. So I think that is why it is really a good idea to think about the account isolation um, per workload um, as far as that is possible to to try to get into troubles with IAM later when you reorg the organization. For yeah, and, and I think this is a particularly hard challenge with AWS generally, that it's it's difficult to migrate workloads between accounts um and so or like transfer ownership essentially of particular things so like in other platforms like say gcp i think it might be a little more a little easier uh perhaps but you know i'm not sure the alternative of creating an account per application or, or workload is is easier because now you have 10 times as many accounts and and you have a whole bunch of cross account access that you need to manage like um like maybe and maybe you get like super good at managing cross account access but like it's something you'll have to do at that point right so yeah that's that's something to to consider yes i know <laughs> so that the thing is the to have to um, split that up into too many AWS accounts adds a lot of complexity as well. So you, agree, I agree. So, but yeah, I think you need to. I, I don't think there is a one fit, <laughs> a one solution for everything. So um, it's it's always important to consider all the things that could come up in the future as well. Maybe think a little bit ahead, what will happen um, if we need to do that and that. So. Yes, I agree. It's sometimes useful to have multiple um, workloads in the same account because it's getting hard to maintain all those accounts and cross access and so on. Totally. It gets easier because of the tooling that AWS provides nowadays, but it's still... Yeah, yeah. It's still some, I, I think it's getting easier. Um, I think the, the part that is... like it's, I think it's actually... I think it's more straightforward in IAM than it is on the network side. Um, and... So, you know, sharing, <laughs> yes. sharing, sharing network resources is, I think, an emerging uh, practice. And there's definitely some good stuff happening there with um, Resource Access Manager. And like, there's some good reference architectures now with uh, the this AWS Secure Environment Accelerator on like how to like share a VPC and like network endpoints like across accounts. But even when I look at that diagram, I'm like, wow, this is like, this is like high tech stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this adds, <laughs> adds a lot of complexity. Yeah, I think that's, that's true. It's not the only, and uh, the, uh, the AWS account boundary, it's not only, you know, I have to think about IAM, but of other aspects as well, like the network, of course, that's, that's totally correct. I think it's also different when working with AWS, whether if you're working on a project on your own or mostly alone, or if it's a whole team or maybe m or multiple teams that, that need to get it right. So, so what are your, um, advices or your experiences with getting IAM right in a, 
large organization where multiple teams, bigger teams are working on architectures, on infrastructures and applications? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think the first thing is to figure out the what, what the real management um, structure is. Um, and like it, I often end up basically modeling the AWS account organization to, to follow roughly the organizational structure. So each business unit or department gets their own set of accounts, um, for dev stage, uh, and production or whatever the, the software delivery lifecycle looks like. And then you create, um, some sort of centralized accounts for security, um, for some shared services, like, you know, some organizations run their own DNS, um, you know, they have other tools they have, uh, and also they have like, uh, CI CD systems like Jenkins, um, they may be running. Those are often like shared services, but sometimes they're not. And each, maybe the department, a given department wants to run their own CI CD system. And because that CI CD system is going to have full access uh, more or less, uh, or like privileged access, at least in each of those accounts, it's important to understand what software delivery looks like and to model the permissions to do that safely within the account. So there's like a whole, there's a whole chapter on this in effective IAM, uh, the book, but like, I think that getting your account architecture, I am a network set up right, uh, or reasonably right, uh, is the most, basically the most important thing for putting a cloud migration on solid ground. What, what do you think? Yeah, it's definitely an important aspect. The, the challenge here that I observe is that when you start <laughs> with an initiative to migrate to the cloud. The problem that, you, that I often have is that it's very unclear territory. So you don't really know a lot of the details yet. So there's a lot of fog everywhere. Um, a lot of decisions may not have been happened already. And so what, what I struggle with as a consultant um, is to really get um, the bigger picture and to to foresee the future a little bit, because mo most often the organization starts with a few migration projects only, and then um, they focus on getting that done and um, shipping that. And it's it's always a little bit hard to to get the the wider view of everything and to understand um, the whole the dependencies and everything, um, because oftentimes, um, yeah, there are a lot of aspects that. <laughs> Um, that are maybe a little bit hidden or not in focus uh, when when doing a cloud migration. So I think that's uh, challenging from my perspective. So what I what I see is that sometimes it makes sense to when when organizations adopt uh, to, uh, the cloud and they start their first steps in the cloud, it might make sense to revisit the whole organization and I am um, concept a little bit later when you have more knowledge about. Uh, what what is going on uh, here, and what are the different um, yeah the different aspects that you need, need to consider? So I think for me I, that has happened multiple times to me when I joined an organization to 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 help with their uh, migration and also greenfield projects. That um, one or two years later, it was a lot clearer <laughs> what the picture looks like, and then we. Um, needed to redo some of that. And I think that's, that's fine as well to, to adapt that. Yeah. Well. I mean, hindsight, hindsight is always clearer, right. Than, than, um, like forecasting. Um, and so mm -hmm. I, and you can also, I think you can also overthink it a lot. So I, I I've, I've seen an organization, they really, they spent two years getting that account structure and everything right. And they really invested a lot of uh, effort into that uh, before migrating a single application <laughs> to the cloud. And I think the the challenge here is um, sometimes you cannot really think uh, about something that you haven't seen or that hasn't started yet. So I think this is also, again, this is a, is a mixture of, of both things. So of, of course you should plan ahead, you should 
take uh, into consideration the the organization and everything but but at the end i think it's also um something you learn a little bit by doing and when more projects come up and you learn more about the organization and um also yes, that it evolves and of course over time yeah it, so, and, and i, I think there's enough material out there at this point enough guidance out there that an organization that actually wants to get something done should be able to get educated um, and make a reasonably good decision in a month or two and like get going. Like you, this should not like block progress. Um, you know, like if nothing else, you know, you can start with control tower and then, um, you know, a lot of, which a lot of people do, uh, of course, then a lot of people then kind of turn it off because some of the service control policies may not allow what they want. But, um, you know, there, there's plenty of reference architectures out there now. And the way I think about it is pick one or, or and then iterate on one that supports your organization's decision-making cycle. So one of the rules I have is I don't ever want two VPs to have to have a conversation about what services are running in their AWS accounts. This is entirely too high of a level to have to mediate something. And what that means is I don't want two VPs workloads running in the same AWS account. Um, going back to, you know, the e-commerce and data warehouse, like the data warehouse may want Redshift. And this and Redshift makes zero sense for an you know an e-commerce or most e-commerce deployments, right? Um, but maybe they both use you know maybe they both use uh, container clusters. Um, maybe they're both going to use ECS or whatever, but they're going to use it in different ways. You know the the data warehouse is going to use batch mode uh, probably a lot and. Uh, all of the, and, and they're, and they're never going to want, um, or they may, they may say they never want, uh, inbound network, um, like via an ALB, but of course the e-commerce group, they need ALBs and, and target groups hooked up to the, the ECS containers. So, uh, you know, we don't want to have to sort this out in, in IAM is it in like tags or whatever, <laughs> Uh, we want to separate these workloads with accounts. So like, you know, there's maybe that's, maybe that's like a very high level view, but you can start there and like refine it. Okay, Stephen. So is there anything else, any aspect that we forgot to talk about when it comes to IAM? Um, anything in I your mind that you want not to so share? Much, uh, something that's been forgotten, but one thing I'd like to just reiterate is to uh, try to scale security by making it usable and understandable for your entire cloud team. And you can do that by productizing little components um, with, with access uh, reporting that non-experts can understand. So, you know, report access in terms of like read data, not S3 get object. Um, so, you know, we should be able to, if we actually want to implement a least privileged model, It requires constant review. Um, and so we need to make that review cycle really quick, uh, a re improvement cycle really quick. Like think about this as an, as a control loop. Like that's where the word control really comes from in security, right? That, um, and so what do people need to be able to do? They need to be able to understand what access is actually there. And then they need to be able to converge it to what they intend correctly and quickly. So like, If we zoom out, that's that's what I feel security uh, should really be about, whether it's about IAM or network um, or or some other aspect of of security. But like, how do we how do we let's, let's try to scale this by making it usable um, and integrated into people's daily jobs, just like we have availability, performance, and other things. Like security, I feel is not so different, other than we haven't put in the work. Uh, as an industry to kind of make it usable by everyone yet. So Stephen, um, you, I, I really like the idea that you shared of um, making security more accessible. 
So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your offering with K9 Security so that people get at it to know a little bit better. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so having spent so many years trying to like secure applications in continuous delivery, I decided like we need to make this easier. So what we do with K9 is we provide infrastructure code components that help you generate least privilege policies where you specify the access you want in terms like read data, write data, administer resource, etc. Uh, and then we give you tools to understand what your access actually is. Um, and we, re we report access to both APIs and keys, buckets, database clusters in that same language, read data, delete data, administer resource, so that all of the policies are, we basically we evaluate all the policies um, that are there in your account and we're just report the effect of access so that you can focus on under like, making a good, good decision. Should this thing have access uh, to delete the database versus does the thing have access to delete the database, which is like the hard intellectual part. <laughs> like, um, so basically you, you're translating that in more humable, your more human understandable language. Yeah. That's I think a really, a really important thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. So the whole team, so the whole cloud team or the whole, the app team can say, yes, uh, this role, this application, uh, the credit applications role should have access to the credit applications S3 bucket. And we can clearly see that, you know, these other hundred roles should not have access to that S3 bucket. Um, and, and, and make it just that clear because we can decide quickly that like, oh yeah, this is, this looks good or this looks bad if we understand actually what's going on. Yeah, totally. So now I like the approach that it's two sided. Basically, it helps you to write new policies, but it also helps you to understand the iron policies that are already in place. So I think that's um, definitely the two sides of the yeah. things that you got to find and fix to get the it problem. right. So thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. We will put the links to uh, K9 security and everything, the book and everything into the show notes so that you, uh, the listener can find that uh, very easily. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Andreas. I appreciate being on. Perfect. So, so did you learn something new by listening to this podcast episode? Then tell your friends and coworkers about it. And also, please, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, you find our contact details in the show notes. So use that to get in touch and uh, to give feedback on the episode. Thanks a lot for listening. We'll be back soon. Bye.